בשם השם נעשה ונצליח. תשעה באב. If you actually can close the door, it makes too much noise. Please. Tisha B'Av, and unfortunately, we do not have the merit to see Mashiach yet. The question is, why? The question is, why don't we have the merit to see Mashiach? Almost every Jew, religious or not religious, knows the song, Mashiach, Mashiach, Mashiach. Every other new song mentions Mashiach. Our prayers mention Mashiach. Birkot HaShachar mention Mashiach. Every year we say, next year Mashiach, next year in Jerusalem. And even people that are completely disconnected from Torah Judaism want the Mashiach to come. Even the Goim, saying he came, he's going to come again. Mistake, but nonetheless, everybody's praying for Mashiach. Where's this Mashiach? Okay, fine, listen. Jews don't necessarily work off of a good schedule. We're always late, but 2,000 years is a little late. A little later than late. Where's this Mashiach? The truth is, that Hashem is doing us a favor. He's doing us a favor, He's doing us a chesed for not bringing Him yet. And the reason why is because we're not ready yet. We'd like for Him to come, but we're not ready for what happens after. If you look at what happens at the time of Mashiach, according to the prophets, according to Zechariah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, several different places, Isaiah, several different places that it mentions the uh, times of Mashiach. Before the celebration begins, before Hashem Yitbach reveals Himself and brings the resurrection of the dead and all the wonderful things that happen after, there's a lot of balagan, if you will. And we're not ready for that balagan. And one of the reasons is because we don't even know what caused it in the first place. Now Tisha B'Av is a reminder of this balagan. Tisha B'Av is a reminder of this disaster that happened to Am Yisrael 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, 3,300 years ago, but also as recent as 70 years ago. For those who don't know, Tisha B'Av is a day that Hashem Yitbarach decided is going to be a day that we are going to cry until the times of Mashiach. When we were crying for no reason, at Mount Sinai, Hashem said, I'm going to give you a reason to cry forever on this day. It's going to be part of your tshuva. Crying yourself into motivation. But motivation to do what? Motivation to do tshuva. Every year I'm going to give you an opportunity to use this day to cry hysterically to do tshuva. And that's what we're supposed to do. Almost a hundred years ago, World War I began on Tisha B'Av. Some of the worst events of World War II also happened on Tisha B'Av. The pogroms, the inquisitions, horrible, awful things happened to Am Yisrael on Tisha B'Av throughout all of history. But I find myself feeling alone with a few others that actually found a way to cry on Tisha B'Av. Most people do not know that it's not necessarily a good thing to cry on Tisha B'Av. It's actually an obligation. As a matter of fact, Chazal says that a person that finds a way to cry on Tisha B'Av and mourn for Yerushalayim 
will be there at the times of its celebration. You mourn for Yerushalayim during the times where it's destructed, during the times where there is all types of secular beliefs controlling it, during the times where there is all types of idolatry surrounding it. If you mourn for Yerushalayim during that time, when it's not so popular, when it's not winning, you mourn for Yerushalayim during that time, that by itself is going to give you the schut to see Yerushalayim after the Mashiach. See Yerushalayim when we're celebrating because we have the Bet HaMikdash HaShlishi Bezat Hashem. So what's this big deal of crying? Anybody could just take one of these vegetables, peel them a little bit and start crying. Anybody can watch a sad movie, start crying. What's the big deal of crying? So the question is, why do we cry? Now, we said before the shiur, for most people it's really, really difficult to cry. Especially on Tisha B'Av. If a woman doesn't get the refrigerator she wanted, she'll cry. If the kid got an F in his class, Mommy's going to cry. The father got fired from his job. He doesn't have any money to buy the newest car. Maybe he's going to cry. Teenager broke up with his girlfriend. He's probably going to cry. Bet the Mikdash was destroyed 2,000 years ago. Not so much. Not so much. As a matter of fact, it's such a strange thing for people that you see that most of the speeches given today are focusing on motivation. Am Yisrael wants to be motivated. They want to be cheered up. They don't want to be sad. They don't want to cry. So you see that many speeches, Tisha B'Av speeches now, not in the past, but now, are trying to motivate Am Yisrael Cheer up. Stop crying. But we weren't crying. So stop crying anyway. Don't cry. But Chazal said, if I don't cry, I'm not going to see Yerushalayim when it's built, rebuilt. So on one end, we don't know why we're going to cry. On another end, some of the leaders and the speakers are telling us we shouldn't cry. We should be motivated. We should cheer up. We should stop being so damp, so sad. The most difficult part, sit on the floor. My whole body is killing me, by the way, from sitting on the floor and sleeping on the floor. For me, that's alone a reason to cry. But really, it's not, that's not why we cry. It's not why we cry. About 70 years ago, six million of our brothers and sisters were murdered in cold blood in the most awful ways recorded in recent history even though it was even worse 2,000 years ago and even worse 3,300 years ago the only people that are alive to witness any of those events are the ones that happened 70 years ago at the Holocaust and we see that awful horrible things happened during this time, I mean, there's some books that have been written about what happened to Ami Sayyid during this time, and uh, you can't help yourself but cry. This is why many Kilot choose to watch Holocaust films during this time. This is the wisdom of their rabbis that know that it's really an obligation for us to cry. And if I told you you have to cry about Moshe Rabbeinu, you're not going to cry. He's in Gan Eden, he's okay now. If I told you you have to cry about the sea of blood, literal sea, a river of blood that flew from, that, that streamed from Jerusalem to the next city, that reached the stomachs of the horses, talking about three feet, four feet. 
a river of blood, of Jewish blood. It's hard to fathom. It's hard to understand this. It's hard to, how could such a thing be possible? I mean, you need hundreds of millions of people. And that's exactly what happened. Most people think that there was always 14 million Jews, or 20 million Jews, or however many Jews we have. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Midrashim, there were many, many more Jews. In last year's lecture, I talked about it, and some people were dumbfounded by it, that there were actually, at the time, according to some of the Midrashim, there were more Jews than there are Chinese people today. There are an extraordinary amount of Jews before the Choban Bet HaMikdash. And we got to a point where so many of them were murdered that it created a sea of blood. But most people can't remember this. Seventy years ago, though, we have some people that can remember it. We have some people that filmed it. We have some stories from holy rabbis that told us about what happened. Different horrific events of how the Nazis used to abuse the Jews in, in, in the most horrific ways possible. But not just torturing them with work, not just torturing them with starvation, but even torturing their children. Um, Rabbi Cheskel wrote in his book that one of the many things that the evil Nazis did that was the same as what happened 2,000 years ago and also what happened in Egypt is that the Nazis would take the children, the Jewish children, the holy Jewish innocent children that didn't do anything, that couldn't defend themselves, and they would use them as sex toys when they were bored, and after that they would kill them. If something like that doesn't make you cry, you have to check your pulse if you're alive. But this happened 70 years ago. We're not supposed to cry about 70 years ago. We're supposed to cry about what happened 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago was much worse. All of us read Megillat Echa, the book of Lamentations that Jeremiah the prophet wrote. Last night, I'm supposed to also read it. Sometimes people, some keilot, read it also today. And if you understood the words, you should have cried. You're supposed to cry. If you didn't cry, you didn't understand. And if you understood and didn't cry, read it again. So no less than three places... Megillat Echa says that the murder of the Goim murdering the Jews by the sword was actually a chesed. They were doing him a favor. He says that the Jews that died by the sword was good for them. It's better for them. Because the more horrific death was a starvation. The starvation was much, much worse because it was self-inflicted. It was caused by Jews. Jews causing other Jews to starve because they thought they had a better way. They thought that they could defend themselves. They were called birionim. They could defend themselves with their muscles. They could defend themselves with their missiles. They could defend themselves with their spears. They could defend themselves with their power. Kochi ve'otzim yadi is what they call it. My power, my hands. We can do it. And anyway, whoever doesn't want to listen, is punished. We'll starve. And this led to starvation. But I'm not talking about starvation like you guys are hungry right now, probably. Or thirsty, at least. I'm not talking about that. You see some people in the Holocaust, pictures of what happened after the starved them for so long, you start getting a sense what starvation looks like. But here in Megillat Echa, it takes it to a new level. Which we mentioned in last year's shiur. 
Here he says in chapter 2, verse 14. Chapter 2, verse 12 first says that they say to their mothers, meaning the children, the babies, are, are looking at their, for their mothers. And they say to their mothers, where is grain and wine? Where is food? As they swoon like a dying man in the streets of the town, the kids are walking around looking for food. Little four, three, four-year-old kids looking for food. As their souls expire in their mother's bosom. Little babies, supposed to be bread fed, are dying while their mothers are holding them because there's no milk, there's no nothing, because the mom is starving herself and she can't produce anything. And as much as she loves her children, she wants to hold them, she wants to feed them, but nothing's coming out, all the way to the extent that she has to watch them die. He says, the prophets envisioned vanity and foolishness for you. He says, why? why did, how did all this happen? How do we get to this? How do we get to become Hashem's enemies? We were Hashem's chosen. How do we get to become His enemies? He says, because the prophets were false prophets. Mm -hmm. The leaders were false leaders. Instead of telling Am Yisrael, it's time to do tshuva, they tell him, listen, Go invest some extra money into your business. As not Hashem, it's going to be okay. Yeah, but you know I'm working on Shabbat though, right? Don't worry, Hashem's going to bless you. He knows you're going to do a lot of mitzvot with that money. He knows you're going to donate to a Beknesset, a Sefer Torah. He knows, it's okay, it's okay. They changed the rules. Because they were more focused on vanity, on getting a fancy cars and fancy houses, much more than fancy souls. And they did not reveal your iniquity to motivate you to return in repentance. They didn't tell you the truth. Hey, by the way, you're Mechalel Shabbat, just so you know, you're an enemy of Hashem. Just so you know, Mechalel Shabbat, enemy of Hashem. Oh, you like to eat non-kosher outside? You're an enemy of Hashem. Just so you know, let you know. Do what you want. But you keep saying Hashem, 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 Baruch Hashem, Be'ezat Hashem, all those things. You mention Hashem, you're like your best friends. I'm just letting you know, at the end of this week's parasha, parashat Vayet Hanan, Hashem says, you're, an, you're his enemy. Oh, me? I'm not, even, I'm not even in the Torah. He goes, no, no, you. He's talking about you. How's he talking about you? He says, to my lovers who keep my mitzvot, I pay them a reward for thousands of generations. I pay them a reward for thousands of generations. Who are my lovers? Ones who keep mitzvot. But my haters... I pay them cash to their face to destroy them. He pays cash to the face to, of, of the person that's not doing mitzvot, that's not keeping mitzvot, that's not keeping the basics of Judaism and Torah. He pays them a reward now. So here these leaders didn't tell them people this. They told them, no, you're okay. Just give tzedakah, you're okay. Just come once a year for Yom Kippur, you're okay. Just say, I'm sorry, Yom Kippur, everything's okay. He says, these prophets, they didn't tell you the truth. That's where we got to that point. They didn't rebuke you. But if that wasn't enough, this was the first level of punishment. He says, if that wasn't enough, it got worse, Jeremiah says. In chapter 3, verse 1, I'm sorry, in uh, chapter 2, verse 19, he says, the infants are fainting from hunger at the heads of every street. He says, it's not just one or two stories here and there you hear of starving kids. He says, every street you see a bunch of starving kids starving to death. But if that wasn't enough, because that was already in the beginning, it was one house. One house was starving. Homeless, miskin, didn't have a, enough money to donate to get this guy some food. He died. That was one story, two stories, three stories. He says it got worse. Shem it started getting to a point every street. 
Every corner, all the kids were starving. And if that was enough, we didn't do tshuva because these false prophets kept telling you invest into the business. They kept telling you invest into everything else but your neshama. Do everything but do tshuva. You're okay, you're okay. Everybody keeps telling you you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. He says, that made it worse. Why? Hashem, Parashat Bechukotai says, You're treating me with casualness. You're thinking that it just happened. It was just a bad season, so a few kids are going to die. It's a bad season, so a few people lose some money in the stock market. It's a bad season. Eh, it happens. People lose. It goes up. It goes down. People always rationalize things. Like It just happens. Hashem says, that made me angrier than the, even the original sin. You sinned already to get me to this point. That was already bad. But when I started slapping you and smacking you and punching you, and you're still saying, nah, it just it's, it happens. It happens. It's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. Nothing's going to be okay if you don't do tshuva. He says, that made him angrier. So what happened next? He says, what's going to happen, Hashem? Shall the women devour their offspring, their own cherished babes? What's going to happen? You keep starving them. Eventually, the parents are starving also. Eventually, the parents are going to eat the kids. Is that what you want to happen, Hashem? In the beginning of chapter 3, he says, I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He says it just got real. It just got worse. We thought a, a kid or two dying from starvation in one neighborhood or two neighborhoods was bad enough. But it got worse. We didn't do tshuva. The false leaders continued leading us falsely. So we didn't think we had to do tshuva. We thought we were just with the chosen people, so everything's okay. So what if I drive on Shabbat? So what if I eat taref? So what if my girlfriend's not Jewish? So what? Hashem chose me. I'm okay. They let us falsely. They told us as long as we give some stakar, everything's going to be okay. As long as we say hi to the rabbi and act like a human being, everything's going to be okay. So Jeremiah says it got worse. It got worse to such an extent that Hashem did a favor to some people by allowing the Goim to kill them with swords because the starvation was much worse. It was so bad that by chapter 4, he says the following. Chapter 4, verse 4, he says, The tongue of the suckling clings, meaning the kids, their tongues clings to the palate of their, from their thirst. Young children ask for bread, but no one offers it to them. Those who feasted on delicacies lie desolate in the streets. He says that starvation is not just for the kids. Now the starvation is for their rich parents too. The Abba and Ima that were driving Bentleys now want to give a Bentley just for a piece of bread. There's actually a story from the times of the Bet HaMikdash of a woman that was so rich her house was full of diamonds. But diamonds, I'm not talking about diamonds like little one carat diamonds you put in a little earring for a little girl. That has uh, rich parents. No, we're talking about diamonds that were like cinder blocks. She sent her servant, go get me some bread, good bread, good quality bread. Servant comes back, he says, there's no more good quality bread. She says, okay, so go get me lesser quality bread, but something. He goes, he says, no, nah, there's not much lesser quality bread. He goes, go get me anything. Sends him a third time, go get me anything. I need to eat, I'm going to starve to death. Get me anything. He goes, so he comes back, there's no more bread. She takes all of our diamonds, she throws them in the street. She says, I can't eat my diamonds. I can't eat my diamonds. I can't eat my Bentley, I can't eat my house. I can't eat it. And she died from starvation. So now it's not just a few kids' stories that you see on TV or some chesed fund advertisement where you're trying to raise some money for some poor family. Now he says, Jeremiah, it got worse. Everyone is starving. Because the Birionim took the food and burned it. Why? They said, either with us or you're against us. So to prove your loyalty to us, so now everybody's starving. But not starving like we talked about we are today. Starving to the point where people are dying. But then it got much, much worse. And a few verses later, he tells us exactly the reason of why we're supposed to cry. 
He says the victims of the sword were more fortunate than the victims of famine. For the latter are stricken, oozing from the lack of the produce of the field. He says the ones that were killed by the sword, Hashem did them a favor. It's much easier death. Why? Because the very next verse, chapter 4, verse 10, says the hands of the merciful women boiled their own sons. They became their food when the daughter of my people was shattered. Shem and Achim, the mothers ended up cooking their own kids. Now anyone who has kids, all they need to do is look at their kid. Five minutes. Think about this, you're crying nonstop. Imagine. Today you're supposed to imagine this. A regular day, you're not necessarily supposed to imagine this. Today you're supposed to imagine it. Look at your kid and imagine, you're not talking about eating another human, which is insanity. There's a story of what happened about 40 years ago. A bunch of athletes were in an uh, airplane crash stuck in a mountain. And uh, to survive, they had to eat the dead. People that died, they had to eat them. And instead of celebrating their survival, the political correctness of the day frowned upon them for eating dead people. What do you want me expect, expecting to die? Because you want me to keep a certain diet? Stupidity. But nonetheless, just so you know, political correctness has always been around. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about eating a stranger for survival. We're talking about getting to such desperation that a mother eating her own kids. For this we cry. And the reason why we cry is because Hashem told us that this is going to happen. In both Parashat Bechukotai and Parashat Kitavo. He says, when you treat me with casualness, I'm going to treat you with casualness. And he says this three times in this, in this uh, Megillat Echa. He talks about the women eating their children three different times. As a matter of fact, even in the keynote that you read after, it also talks about it. This is not like it just, just happened once and never again, one neighborhood, crazy people. This is a massive nationwide thing. This is what we read after Megillat Echa. We offered a sacrifice and it was not accepted. Meaning we gave Hashem Korban and He didn't want it. This is too late. Too late for Korbanot. Why? Because you're Mechalel Shabbat. Korban of Mechalel Shabbat, not accepted in Shemaim. Korban of Agoy, accepted. Korban Mechalel Shabbat, not accepted. He says, you want to continue being Mechalel Shabbat but bring me a Korban? Why, you think I need your goat? You think I need your cow? Do you I need your, your chicken? I don't need anything. Everything is mine, Hashem says. You think I need your goat? For that you're going to get punished. For the chutzpah, you think I need the goat, you're going to get punished for that. For the korban, you're going to get punished. What's the punishment? Next verse says it. Same, same thing in the tefillah it says. When our sin offerings and go, uh, of the goat ceased, compassionate women seethed their own children and the constellation of the fish hid their eyes. It says the women ate their children. This is a very known thing. By the way, last year, Shior in uh, for Chazak, we did it in New York, Baruch Hashem, was many people. Everyone was shocked. Maybe six, seven hundred people in attendance. I think if I was able to see everyone's faces, everyone's face had the same expression. Everyone's face was open, like many of yours now. But even worse so, when I showed them proof that this also happened during the Holocaust. The same horrific thing happened in the Holocaust. Why do I mention this horrific thing? Why? Why have some type of uh, sick fixation over this? The truth is, this is a prophecy. Hashem says in Parashat Bechukotai, He says in Parashat Kitavo, the half a dozen places in the Torah He mentions this is such a punishment does exist. Where He will take us from such treasures and glamour 
and significant positions in politics and so on and will get us so low that even the lowest we can imagine is not low enough. For what sin? For what? For, for, for what? This is Gainom in this world. He says, for treating me with casualness. I gave you an opportunity to do tshuva. I gave you a slap. I sent you a message. I sent you a text. I sent you an email. I gave you a little bit of pain on the side. I gave you signs. I gave you signs. Shlom Bait wasn't so good. Panasa wasn't so good. The kids weren't so happy. I gave you signs. Every day I gave you signs. I woke you up. I even woke you up in the middle of the night. You couldn't sleep. What do you think? I didn't want you to sleep. I want you to go learn Torah. I gave you signs. But you said, nah, it's just, I have a headache. No, nah, it's just the stock market. No, nah, it's just the economy. No, nah, it's just the mood. No, nah, it's just the time of the month. Every sign I gave you, you treated it with casualness. You treat it like it's just happenstance. It's nature. It happens. You know, you did it once. You're going to do it again. All this shtuyot, nonsense that people make you believe. No, no, it's going to be okay. Why is it going to be okay? Who's going to make it okay? Me? I can't do anything. I'm a human being. I came from a little seed, and eventually the maggots are going to eat my body. What could I possibly do without Hashem? What could I do? No, it's going to be okay. You think it's going to be okay with your own hands? He says that you get punished for. You get punished for the sins, and even more so you get punished for that. For that we cry. Because we still have this warped mentality that we don't need God. He needs us. Almost every day I have somebody telling me about all the mitzvot that they're doing. Oh, you know, today I prayed at this time, and today I did this, and today I did that. Or sometimes they send me an email and say, Yo, you know, just before I sent you this email, I was reading Parashat Shavua. Oh, you know, today I studied for 15 minutes. It's good. It's good. What's bad is what follows. So how come Hashem didn't give me the car I wanted yet? How come I'm not rich yet? How come I don't have as much money as I want? How come this and how come that and how come and how come and how come? They come into complaints against Hashem. Why am I this and why am I that? Interestingly enough, as Hashem would have it, the book of Lamentations is, is called Echa in Hebrew. Echa means why? Oh, I'm sorry, how? How? How did it happen? Echa is not a name. I actually, for many years, I thought Echa was a name. It was like one of the prophets, maybe. I didn't know. You start reading, it's like, just the first few words. First few words, everything changes. Why? Because he starts with a question. How did this happen? How did Choban Bet HaMikdash happen? The first one, the second one, the pogroms, the inquisitions, the holocaust, all. How did it happen? He gives you, an, gives you a question. Same question. This question is relevant forever. How did this happen? How do we go before this? He says all of the nations would look to the Jews and admire them. In fact, the Romans were not even mentioned in anything until Choban Bet HaMikdash was on its way. Until they started attacking the Jews, they were nothing. According to historians, we're not even talking about talking to the Jews. According to the historians, until the time they started going against Am Yisrael, Hashem used them as a tool to go against Am Yisrael, the Romans were nothing. The Greeks were nothing. The Germans were nothing. None of these countries were anything until they went against the Jews. Meaning that Hashem only brought them to the world to hit his kids. They only existed as a tool, as the stick that Hashem needs to use to hit us once in a while 
to cause us to cry in order to motivate us into tshuva. Because unfortunately the prophets, the rabbis, the leaders of the time were not doing it. So Shem says, when they're not going to do it, I have to. But when I do it, it hurts a little bit. So in the beginning of the book of Echa, he says, how did this all happen? But again, we ask the same question. This happened 2,000 years ago. No one has that good of a memory to remember what he did in this Neshama 2,000 years ago. Your previous Gilgulim. How does Hashem Barach expect us to cry to such an extent that he makes it a chova? Where he says, you want to see Bet HaMikdash, you want to see Yerushalayim after it's rebuilt, you must cry on Tisha B'Av. You must mourn, not cry like because you uh, ate an onion. You must mourn. So the answer is, In the book of Echa, he says, how did it happen? And shortly after, he says, it happened because we sinned against Hashem. In the first Bet HaMikdash, it was three major sins. Idolatry was one of the worst things that you can do in the Torah. That was one of them we did. Second one was Gilu Arayot. Gilu Arayot was sex crimes. Things, uh, promiscuity, men with women that are not his wife, incest, things of that nature. And the third one was murder. It's three major sins. The second Bet HaMikdash was Sinat Chinam. Hating each other for no reason. Hey, you know him? Yeah, I hate him. Why? I hate him. And he has that face. I hate him. Why? What did he do to you? You know him? You know his family? You know his history? No, I don't know him. I just, but you know, he has one of those faces. I don't like it. Yeah, I hate that guy. That. That. That's what we think is that. I hate him. So, Chazal is explaining to us that Sinat Chinam, in essence, has the same weight as the three other sins. Sinat Chinam, 2,000 years, we can't fix it. But the promiscuity, murder, idolatry, we fixed after 70 years. So saying that this is the same weight. The Chidush is that we cry not because of that. We cry because we're actually now, we haven't had the Bet HaMikdash for 2,000 years, because now we're worse than both of the times. If the Bet HaMikdash was built today, Hashem would have to destroy it again. And the reason why is because today, unfortunately, the truth is, the hard truth, and as painful as it sounds, it's a reality. We're committing all four of those sins, all of them, today. But we're committing him in such a way that we don't even think we're doing anything wrong. We've gotten so used to sin that we're treating any punishments from Shemaim with casualness. And as Rabbi Israel Misalant says, we have a extraordinary amount of diseases that are physical diseases, but just as many doctors to fix those diseases, physical diseases. But when it comes to spiritual diseases, he says we have a, even more diseases, spiritually speaking, and no doctors. And the reason why there's no doctors is because there's only one cure. And the cure is teaching Musa in order to learn Yirat Shamayim. Only one cure. That's it. There's no other cure, Rabbi Yisrael Misalant says. Rabbi Yisrael Misalant, for anyone who doesn't know, started a Musar movement, 
was such a holy man he got to a point of having Ruach HaKodesh he's one of the last few that actually had Ruach HaKodesh and he left everything all of his studies all of the things why to go do Kiru for 26 years at the height of his career he left everything he says listen everybody's going off to there okay what's the king when everyone knew everything is good in my yeshiva my call everything is good but what about the rest of Am Yisrael? they're still not crying on Tisha B'Av they still think everything's okay he left everything started traveling the world to go help people do tshuva 26 years why because he says there's only one cure and no one wants to give this cure and the Mishnah in Avot says, Makom she'en ish, yot ish, a place that there's no leader. Be the leader yourself. So in today's world, almost 200 years after Rabbi Yisrael Misalant, unfortunately we're in a not so much better position. And one of the main reasons is because we're trying to motivate Am Yisrael to do tshuva in a different way. We're trying to motivate him to do tshuva as if it's a cool thing to do. Go, keep Shabbat, you can hang out, you can eat food, it's fun, you can relax. We're trying to make it hip. We're trying to make it hip to be Shomer Mitzvot. They make seminars and they bring singers, secular singers, to these seminars. So you can bring, so that drags, that brings the crowd. Really, the people are not coming for the, for, the, for the rabbi. They don't care about the rabbi. They're coming for the singer. They're coming for the singer. They fill up the place with 500 people, 1,000 people, 2,000 people to come listen to the singer. But it's like, oh, since I'm already here, I'm going to listen to the rabbi. Trying to use different shitot, different strategies to get Amisad to do tshuva. Now, this would be wonderful if it actually worked. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. 80% of Am is still not keeping nothing. Maybe once in a while they do a mitzvah by accident, but Shabbat, basic core foundation of Judaism, they don't keep. Learning Torah every day, they don't keep. Why? We're using the wrong medicine. We're telling people that it's fun and it's cool and you should do it because it's good for you because it's nice. We're not telling people the truth. We're not telling people, listen, you have to do it because yes, aside from the fact that it is fun ultimately, it is good ultimately. It is healthy ultimately. Really, the only reason you should do it is because you have to. That's the real reason. You have to. Why? Because if you don't, you're going to get punished. That's the real reason. If you don't teach someone that if they don't do tshuva, they're going to get punished, whatever tshuva they do, it's not going to hold. It's not going to hold. They'll do half a tshuva. You know, there's a bunch of people that keep Shabbat, but they eat taref the whole week. Or they eat kosher, but they don't keep Shabbat. They do one mitzvah, but they do 150,000 averot. Why? Because they're not. It's, you know, I took this on. I'm, I'm here. I'm okay with just this. They pick one mitzvah, and that's enough. I want to just do Shabbat. 20 years of Shabbat. Yeah, what about learning Torah? Well, no, I don't do Torah. But do you know, if you don't learn Torah, then the Shabbat, even the Shabbat that you're keeping is probably not Shabbat. Why? Because you're probably violating Shabbat. If you don't know Allahot Shabbat, you're definitely breaking Shabbat. So even what you think you're keeping, you're not keeping. Meaning you come to Shabbat and say, oh, you mechalel Shabbat. No, I kept Shabbat. What Shabbat do you keep? Every Shabbat you borer. Every Shabbat you're doing sins, they all right. Every Shabbat. Not one Shabbat you kept. Oh, except one Shabbat you were in the hospital, you were sleeping the whole time. By accident you kept Shabbat. If we don't teach Am Yisrael that we can't te- treat Hashem with casualness, the tshuva that we do is not going to be a real tshuva. And this is the reason why most people don't understand that at this stage, Am Yisrael, different people, different places, is making all of those sins, not just one of them. When it comes to Avodah Zarah, the Gemara says the real reason why Hashem destroyed the Bet HaMikdash, Gemara Masechet Shabbat, page 119, Abayah says the real reason Hashem destroyed Bet HaMikdash, Chilul Shabbat. Chilul Shabbat. The question is, but it says, Shfichut Amim, it says Avodah Zarah, 
It says Gilu'i Ayot. It says all these other things. It says, you know, idol worship. It says, you know, uh, sex crime. Sex. Uh, where does it doesn't say anything about Shabbat? It says, no, no. Somebody violates Shabbat, idolatry, same thing. A Jew drives on Shabbat, same thing as an idol worshiper, according to the Torah. Same thing. It's a hard thing to say. It's a hard thing to hear, but it's true. Unless we tell people the truth, they're not going to know. So Shabbat, we already know, idol worship, we're not doing so good in. Aside from that, the new idol that we have for the last couple of thousand years is an idol in disguise. It's called money. People spend their entire lives chasing money and chasing away God. The more money they have, the less God they have many times. The Gemara says you give, a, you give a person 100, he wants 200. You give him 200, he wants 400. You give him 400, he wants 800. So what happens is that someone that gets more and more money, Hashem gives him a blessing, giving him more money. Eventually he thinks that, no, no, once I'm rich, I'm going to do tshuva. What happens is the more money he has, the more money he wants. Which means the less time he has for God. So he used to be religious, little avrech, went into the business world, Hashem gave him success. Now, he does shema Yisrael once a day. That's it. He doesn't have time for God. People think that they're doing God a favor by doing shema Yisrael or by doing any of the mitzvot. They complain against God. Oh, I did a few mitzvot, so how come he doesn't do this? How come he doesn't do that? In reality, we have to understand that all of these mitzvot, all of the Torah we learn, all of the things we do is for us. It's not for him. He's perfect. So when it comes to idolatry, in today's age, we have two forms. We have one, we have Chilul Shabbat. Two, we have worshipping money. And three is not as, not as uh, significant, but it's people that go and actually worship idols. They leave Judaism to go to Christianity, or they go to Buddhism, or any of these other garbage that's in the world. There's many that go there. When it comes to murder, unfortunately, murder is still happening. And, sh and when it comes to immodesty, it's also happening. But in both of those cases, it's actually much worse. It's much worse than it was 2,000 years ago. And the reason why is because one of the things that Am Yisrael is obligated to do, even more so than the Goyim, the Goyim are also obligated to do it, but Am Yisrael even more so, is we're not allowed to waste seed. A Jew is not allowed to waste his seed. So every time seed comes out of a Jewish person, or even a non-Jewish person, it must be for the purpose of bringing a child to the world. Whether it ends up bringing a child to the world or not, it's not your business. That's Hashem's business. Hashem decides. But a Jew must have procreation with one purpose in mind, is I'm trying to bring a kid to the world. What if I know it's physically impossible? She's too old, or because she's already pregnant. You can't be pregnant twice at the same time. So it's not your business. It's not your business. You are doing it in a kosher way. There's a kosher way to procreate, a kosher way to be intimate with your wife. To do it any other way that would lead a male to ejaculate without having a purpose of bringing a child to the world, or at least a chance, is considered both immodesty and murder. But even more so than that, one of the things that we know that saved us at the times of Egypt was that we didn't, you know, we still wore our clothes. We didn't fall into these few things that the Egyptians did. And one of the things I actually found out recently, I heard about it a long time ago, but actually got some verification of it recently, is that one of the minagim, one of the cultural uh, things that the Egyptians did that we get credit for not doing is that the Egyptians wore wigs. The Egyptians wore wigs. All the movies, I remember as a kid watching movies, you know, all the Egyptians always looked the same and, you know, I guess it was part of their culture to wear this certain type of wig that looked like Cleopatra and so on. And this was one of the Masegui, this is one of the things that we did back then. Now, despite the confusion 
in the Jewish world as far as halacha, what's allowed, what's not allowed, if a wig is allowed at all, if a wig is not allowed, there's a handful of Ashkenazi poskim that have said it's allowed in past generations, but over 90 different poskim said it's not allowed, both Ashkenazi and Sephardic. But any of the ones that said it's allowed, we're talking about a different type of wig. We're talking about a very, very short, modest wig that was identifiable that it was a wig. It's obvious that it was a wig. But I don't mean obvious to the woman wearing it. Obvious to an every man. Would look at it from far away, know it's a wig. Why? Because it looked like a broom. It looked distinctly different from her, from her natural human hair. That's what they approved. The wigs of today, we see that they look better than natural hair. And even women can't tell. Forget men. Men can't. I don't think there's one man that's, that's outside of the hair business that can tell if a woman wearing a wig is wearing a wig. I have yet to meet one. Which means that even if there's average of males can't tell if it's a wig, you're not allowed to wear it. Because it's not supposed to look like your hair. But if you look at some of these books that were written about wigs, written about hair, from secular people, goyim even in some cases, there's a uh, book, I think it's called The Life of Hair or something like that, and uh, she, she goes and she does research on hair in different places, and she says that she went to different uh, Jewish places, and she would talk to the uh, women there. She would talk to the woman that's putting the wig on them. Because it's a wig place slash hair salon. And she said, what's the, you know, what's the ultimate wig? What's the main purpose of your wig? Both to the client and to the woman that's putting the wig on her. And she said, for it to look like real hair. For it to look like my hair. So the ultimate thing is for it to look like what you're not allowed to have. This is the first, this is first base against logic. You're not allowed to show your hair, but your ultimate purpose here is to make the hair look like your hair. So already you're going against logic. You're trying to do everything in your power to look like something you're not allowed to look like. That's one. How do they do it? Main thing is, is that they use natural human hair, which leads to the next problem. In the very same book, they confirmed the research that Rav Yashiv, Zechat Tzadik Libracha, had done, and said it confirmed that the overwhelming majority of real hair that's put in wigs is coming from India. In India, it is part of their tradition, it is part of their culture to do idol worship. And part of the idol worship is to give the hair as a donation to the idols. One of the idols made it a rule to give the hair, and the reason why is because the idol got hit in the head one time, and he got a bald spot, so some woman gave him a hair and they made it a tradition from that, on, that day on that you give hair to this idol. Yes, I know this sounds stupid, but this is a reality. Another idol got married, wanted to get married, but he didn't have any money. So some woman sold her hair for this idol to get married. What kind of idol is this? I don't know. What kind of God needs money? I don't know. These strange religions. But again, this is, this is actually what's happening here. So they donate hair to this idol. And, the, and, 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 the, and these things get stupider and stupider. But on a financial perspective, the place where they make the most amount of wigs happens to be the second richest entity on the planet. If it gives you an idea of how many hairs, how many wigs are made from there, how much hair is donated there, it's only second to the Vatican. And they sell this hair to different markets in London, in France, in Italy, in different places all over the world. 
Many times it goes to China on the way and eventually it gets to America. Now, Gemara Masechet Avodah Zarah says that anything that was ever connected to idol worship, you are not allowed to enjoy it at all, ever. Prime example, when Yeshua ben Nun brought Am Yisrael to Eretz Yisrael for the first time, first mission he had, Hashem said, burn all these trees, all these Asher trees. What would the trees do? Why are we burning them? Why don't we cut them, make some houses, cut them, make some closets, I don't know, something. Different cabinets for Sifret Torah, I don't know, something. Why are we burning them? Burning them, it just goes to waste. Because no, they were used for idol worship. Why, it's the tree's fault they were used for idol worship? But the tree said, hey, hey, come here, come here. What the tree do? The tree's just sitting there. If some idiot comes and worships him, it's not his fault. Hashem says, idol worship disgusts me so much that even if it's not of the fault of the idol, it's irrelevant. As soon as something was worse was used to replace me, to replace Hashem Barach, it has no right to exist. It's your obligation to burn it. So now you have hair donated by the millions every day to such an extent that a country with nearly a billion people has an average of each person donating their hair at least twice in their life. We're not talking about a small market here. We're talking about the overwhelming majority of the market to such an extent that according to my research, which this is what I did for almost 20 years on Wall Street, it's virtually impossible. Impossible to find a wig with, that's made from natural hair without it coming from idol worship. Impossible. And one reason is because most of the hair is coming from India. That's one. That's a logical reason. The second reason is because even if all of the hair did not come from India, at least one hair did. And that's the reality of it, that with wigs, it's not that they take the hair of one woman, they put it on another woman. No, they take the hair and then it goes through a processing and it's mixed with other hair. It's mixed with other hair that's the same length. It's longer, shorter, and so on to make a wig, meaning there's no one wig that has all one hair. So even if you got 99.9% .9 of the hair from, I don't know, China, some poor woman from China donated her hair for, I don't know, for a cancer patient or something, or some... Uh, Hippie from America decided to donate the hair and it got there, it got to the manufacturing. If one hair from India arrived and is mixed in that wig, it's 100% not allowed. You're putting idol worship on top of your head. And then people are asking, how come my prayers are not answered? Well, because you're praying to a God that's not God. He's in the way. So now we have idol worship in these wigs. Third rational point is that one of the things that's asu, as far as gilu yarayot, not allowed to look at places you're not allowed to, a woman that's not your wife, not allowed, to, not allowed to stare at her, you have to watch your eyes, it leads to wasting seed, it leads to a lot of sins. These wigs also lead to that. And the reason why is a woman is not allowed to show her hair, so what does she do? She puts some other woman's hair. So now, not only are you violating the first two things we already talked about, but even worse, now we're in a situation where you're causing your husband and other men to look at this hair. And even your own husband is looking at a different woman's hair. So now, instead of your husband looking at your hair, which he's allowed to look at your hair, he's looking at a different woman's hair. Fourth point. Even from the time of Avram Avinu, we knew that Hashem chose us. He said, you're not allowed to be with a people that's not part of yours. So when Nimrod, a Rasha, turned himself into an idol, Avram said, you're not an idol, you're not a god, you're nothing, you're old. You had diarrhea last week. Your back doesn't look so good. You're limping. What kind of god are you? You're not a god. He goes, either bow to me or I'm going to kill you. No problem, I'll jump into the fire myself. Avram jumped into the fire. No second thoughts like us. Oh, should we do feeding on time? Should we wake up? No, he jumped into the fire, Avram. Mm -hmm. 
the Malachim went to Hashem, 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 please, let us save this holy man. Hashem Itbarach, according to the Midrash, says, no, no, no. He is one. Down there, just like I am one over here. I'm going to go save him. I'm going to go save him. It says that Nimrod saw two bodies, two images walking inside the fire. Hashem and Avram. If it wasn't written in Midrashim, we wouldn't be allowed to say because Hashem has no image, no likeness of an image. But two images in the fire. Nimrod Rasha was so fascinated by this that he told his son, it's better that you be a slave for Avram than a king with me. And he sent his son with Avram. Who was his son? Eliezer. Eliezer was his son. Eliezer, according to our Torah, got to such a level that he never died. Hashem took him. He was one of ten people that got to Gan Eden alive. Got to Gan Eden alive. Hopefully we get there dead. He got there alive. But still, when he offered his daughters to Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu says, no, you're in a nation of Aurim, I'm in a nation of Buchim. Your nation and the Canaanites are cursed by Hashem. My nation are blessed by Hashem. If I was Eliezer, I'd take a person, hey, hey, I'm your number one guy, I'm a rabbi, I give Shiret Torah, I this, I that, but we call me cursed, I did Shuva. Eliezer didn't take it that way. Eliezer got all of the merits that he got because he didn't take it personally. He knew it was true. He knew it was real. He said, no problem, Avam. I'll go find your son a wife. And he went with full cover and eye and found his son a wife. So even from the time of Avraham Avinu, we knew that we're not allowed to be with the green. When a woman wears a wig made from natural hair, Aside from violating the first four points, the fourth point being that she's causing her husband and other men to looking at a woman, woman said it's not hers, eshet ish, but she's also causing them to 99.9999999% of the time to look at the beauty of a Goya, the beauty of a non-Jewish woman. So now you have point number five. Now you're going to a point where this Giloy Arayot, this immodesty, this Avodah Zarah, it's getting worse and worse. And last but not least is a point that I mentioned in last year's Tisha B'Av Shu, is that if you look at all of the holy women in a Torah, they're constantly admired by Hashem for their modesty. There's only one woman in the entire Torah where they mention her hair. Only one woman. And who is that woman? The Sota. The woman that's accused of cheating on her husband. That's the only woman that her hair is mentioned. So my question to Am Yisrael, and this is pertaining to the religious people, because non-religious people don't wear wigs. At least not for religious reasons. My question to Am Yisrael is... Even if you found an excuse for the halacha, even if you found an excuse for the gilu erayot, even if you found an excuse for the avodah zarah, even if you found an excuse for everything else, why do you want to look like a sota? Why would you want to emulate the only woman in the Torah that's mentioned that's showing her hair? Why would you want to emulate her? Why wouldn't you want to be like Sarah Imenu, Leah, Rachel, Rivka, Hannah, all these tzaddikot, Ruth? Why? They mentioned that they had curly hair up to their... Uh... No! Why wouldn't you want to emulate them? Why do you want to emulate the one that's accused for cheating on her husband? That has a whole Gemara tractate written about her, Masechet Sotah. There's a whole Gemara tractate talking about the Sotah. 
what they do to her, this and that, punishment, Shem Rachem. Why? My point here is that we cry today not because of what happened 2,000 years ago. It's not crying about the Bet Mikdash. As a matter of fact, we should celebrate that Hashem put His wrath on stones and not on us. He could have destroyed us completely. But He had mercy on us and we're still here, Baruch Hashem, 2,000 years later. We're not crying about the Bet Mikdash from 2,000 years ago. We're crying about today. We're crying that the reason why Hashem destroyed the Bet Mikdash is still valid. It's still valid. The Sinat Chinam that we had 2,000 years ago is still valid. If the first Bet Mikdash three reasons were not enough to prove to you that it's still valid, this last one will. Yesterday, the night of Tisha B'Av, I have this few people that I guess are a little bit obsessed with me. I don't know what's wrong with them, why they don't like me, what they don't, but I don't usually when I don't like somebody, I just disassociate with them. They try to invest their life to get my attention. So on the night, on the night of Tisha B'Av, one of these fools takes time out of his day and writes a three-page or three paragraphs insult, public insult about me. I'm this and I'm that and I'm this and I'm that and I do this and I do that and I do this and I do that. Aside from the fact that it's all falsehood and nonsense, I ask myself the question, did his rabbi tell him that even if everything he says in his three paragraphs is true, I'm a thief and I'm a liar and I teach people fear and all types of stuyot that he said. Even if everything he said about me is real, let's say it's real. Does his rabbi tell him, does his rabbi have the courage to tell him that the punishment for embarrassing another person in public is much, much worse than the sins he is accusing me of. A thief I am not. Everyone that knows me knows I'm not. I work for free. I always have. Even on Wall Street where I could steal money like it was uh, on the floor, I chose not to. I had plenty of opportunities. I wrote articles for the regulators to review, to teach them how the thieves are stealing money from them, to help them. My whole life was against thieves. My whole career was against thieves. During a crisis when everybody was trying to find a way to survive, I had ways to make five, ten million dollars a month in an illegal way. People told me, why don't you just do it once? You don't have to do it a lot of times. Once. I said, I'd rather die than steal a dollar. Die than steal one dollar. At the early part of my career, after I just started making a little bit of money, you know, you're 23 years old, you just made a few bucks, you want more. Somebody offered me $3.6 million to come to their firm. I told them, no problem, okay, I'll come to your firm under one condition. Tell me what kind of firm it is. And he tells me what kind of firm he has, and this and that, and then within five minutes, I tell him, oh, okay, so you guys are thieves. No, no, we just do it. I'm like, I'm sorry. I can't come. $3.6 million cash, and once you come, it's another $5 million. You're talking about almost $10 million for a 23-year-old kid on day one. I said, no. I'd rather die than steal $1. But he wrote a whole thing about how I'm a thief and a liar and a cheat and all these things that he thinks he knows. Now, even if it was true, I'm a thief and a liar. And all this thing. Jewish, if he wasn't Jewish, he would care. He would consider him in the world. Bechlal. He takes his time to write this to me. And he makes sure that I know it. So he puts me on the tag. He tags me on Facebook. Now my question is this. Did his rabbi tell him, did his rabbi have the courage to tell him that even if it's all true, His sin is worse.
I don't care about him or the stuff that he wrote. I only mention it to bring a point for people to understand that if someone is stupid enough, stupid enough to make this sin on Tisha B'Av, and he's supposed to be religious, he's not a secular person. Religious Jew thinks he's a Talmud Chacham, he's upset that he's not a famous rabbi. Did anybody tell him? Did anybody tell him? Anybody have the courage to tell him? This is why we cry. We cry because all of those sins are much worse today, both from the first Beta Mikdash and the second. They're all very much alive and well. And even though he deleted it a few hours later, it was enough time for me to see it, record it, and of course, more than enough time for Hashem Barach to see it. Even though some of these people try to do tshuva here and there, they try to fix something, they try to fix that, there's certain things you just can't fix unless you get to the real tshuva. So we cry today, not because of the fast. The Gemara in Masechet Ta'anit, page 15, it mentions a verse in the Torah, in, in uh, Sefer Yoel. Hashem says, don't rip your clothes. Rip your hearts. Do tshuva. I don't care about your fast. I don't care if you eat or you don't eat. I don't care if you rip your clothes or your clothes are dirty, your clothes are clean, your clothes are this, your clothes are that. I don't care if you brush your teeth. I don't care if you put some powder on your face, make you look like you just came out of some uh, disaster. I don't care about that. I care about what's inside. What happened inside? Do you have a choban bet mikdash inside you? Do you realize that as long as there's no bet mikdash, you are contributing into, to it? You are part of it. A Jew must understand that as long as the Bet HaMikdash is not built, he's part of the reason. Yes, even if he's keeping mitzvot. Yes, even if he does tefillin and he goes to Bet Knesset. Yes, even if he's speaking to you right now. He's part of it. Why? Because you didn't do enough. There's still people writing stuff against Hashem on the internet. There's still people idol worshiping. There's still people stealing. There's still people that are cheap. There's still people with bad midot. There's still people that are wearing idol worship on top of their head. There's still people that are so far from Hashem, they don't even know what kosher is. There are over one million children in Eretz Israel who do not know Kriyat Shema. In Eretz Israel, one million children do not know how to say Shema Israel. There's still one million children in Eretz Yisrael who don't have food. This is a land no different than America as far as prosperity. Very modernized place, very rich country, fantastic economy, leading technology in some cases even better than America. But you have one million kids who don't know where they're going to eat today. And it's not because of the fest. But yet you have other people that sold companies to Google for half a billion dollars, two billion dollars, three billion dollars. What are they worrying about? Putting cars inside their living rooms. You have a million kids don't have food. But you're worried about putting a car inside your living room. You have a million kids don't know Kriyat Shema, but they donate Chai. People think that they made a big mitzvah. They made 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars last month, but they donate Chai. They donate 18 dollars. Rabbi Ephraim said it's better off they, they donate met. Because chai is chet yud. Kimatre value, 18. That's why 18 is a number. It's a common number of people donate. Met means dead. Chai means alive. Met means dead. But met is 440. It's better you donate met than chai. People try to connect all these things, but the reality is we're far away from the truth. The reality is that the very same reason that the Beta Mikdash was destroyed is still alive and well. 
In the book of Echa, it talks about these false prophets, these false leaders. In the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, page 54 and 55, especially 54, it talks about how Hashem punished the rabbis first. So the Gemara asks, Hashem, why did you punish the rabbis? They, they went to Beknesset. They put tefillin on. Rashi, Rabbeinu Tam, Etrog, 200 bucks at least. Lulav, Meudal, everything great. What happened? Why? Why? They had a hat, everything. They look like rabbis. They learned Torah. Why'd you punish them first? And the Gemara answers, because they weren't really tzaddikim. They weren't really tzaddikim. Why weren't they weren't tzaddikim? Because they didn't fulfill the mitzvah of rebuking their brothers. They didn't fulfill the mitzvah of telling their brothers and sisters, Achi, Achoti, it's time to do tshuva. Don't worry about the fast. Don't worry about not eating, eating. Don't worry about the clothes where you're wearing black and white, they're just wearing regular clothes. At least it's modest. What's inside you? What's inside you? They didn't do it. Ma says they're worse than all of them. They get punished first. Why they get punished first? They knew the truth. They knew the truth. They had an option. The big brother is supposed to educate the little brother. The big brother is the one that's supposed to cry because he, not because of what happened 20, 30, 40 years ago, 70 years ago, 2,000 years ago. He's supposed to cry because of what's happening today. And what's happening today is we're missing the point. We think it's because of Sinat Chinam from 2,000 years ago. We think it's because of Sinat Chinam today because some Safari doesn't like Ashkenazi, or the Ashkenazi doesn't like the Yemenite, or the Yemenite doesn't like this one. We think that's the Sinat Chinam we have. No, it's not. The biggest difficulty we have today is between the religious and the non-religious. That's the Sinat Chinam we have. It has nothing to do with Safari, Ashkenazi, Yemenite, and Litvish, and all that other stuff. It has to do between the religious and the not religious. The religious, they know the truth, they take care of themselves. The non-religious don't know the truth, but they take care of themselves. Both think that they're going in the right way. Both think that they're okay. Both think that they have Olam Abba. Both think that Mashiach is going to come, he's going to help them. Little do they know that for the vast majority of them, it's not going to be so okay. When Am Yisrael was taken out of Egypt, Hashem Barach had to do some serious damage first. He killed 80% of Am Yisrael during the plague of darkness. And only 20% actually left Egypt. The Midrash Me'am Lo'el says it was really only 1% left Egypt. 99% were killed. And the reason why is because they didn't do tshuva. Hashem says if you don't do tshuva, you can't get to me. Without tshuva, you can't get to me. The religious people in the world need to understand that as long as the non-religious stay non-religious without knowledge, stay non-religious without even a chance, the onus is on them. The responsibility is on them. The responsibility is on us that we know the truth. We know that if you don't keep Shabbat, you have a problem. We know if you don't keep kosher, you have a problem. We know if you don't keep talat mishpacha, you have a problem. But we're not talking about a problem like a headache that goes away after a few hours. We're talking about an eternal problem. And if you know that information, but your cousin, your brother, your neighbor, your someone in your keilah does not know it, the responsibility falls on you. He's punished too. Because he's responsible to also learn Torah. But the fact that you didn't tell him makes you know better. So when the religious say, no, no, I don't want my son to marry a Baal Tshuva. Or I don't want my daughter to marry a Baal Tshuva. That just discourages the Baal Tshuva even more. Because once he finally did Tshuva, you don't want to accept him anyway. Once the guy finally converted, you don't want to get him anyway. Once the woman converted, you don't want to take him anyway. Why? Because we're different. We're separated. Because we're already religious from birth. 
You should learn Rambam. Rambam says, same thing as the Gemara, the Baal Tshuva, serious Baal Tshuva, is higher than someone that's from, from birth. But we'll ignore the facts. So not only are we getting in the way of tshuva, we're not assisting it in any way. That's the problem with the religious world. The non-religious world, the onus is on them because they're responsible to ask the simple question, why am I in this world? Why am I in this world? Why did I come here? What's the difference between me and a horse? What's the difference between me and a cow? Why do I feel okay with murdering a cow and eating it? Kosher or non-kosher? What gives me the right to eat the cow? What, because it doesn't talk? Maybe it does talk, I just don't understand. If anything, the cow looks happier than you. Doesn't have to fast. Doesn't have a mortgage. All of its kids love it. No one mouths off. I don't think there's any, any such thing as shlom bite problems. If anything, the cow is happier than you. What gives you the right to kill it? A person needs to ask themselves, what's the difference between me and the monkey? What's the difference between me and the cow? Once you start delving into the issue, you start understanding, obviously someone puts you here for a reason. And that someone puts you here for a reason as a Jew. Whether you converted, you were natural born, it's all the same. The point being is that right now you're a Jew. Right now you want to be a Jew. Right now you're doing tshuva. Right now you're something, you're connecting to Hashem. Why? He gave you a book of instructions. It tells you why. It's called Torah. You have to ask yourself the question of why. So for anyone that's asking, why do we fast? It's not because Hashem cares if you eat. He doesn't. It's not because Hashem cares what you wear. He doesn't. It's because it's supposed to eliminate all the material from your life and leave you with nothing to do but ask that question. You're not supposed to work today. You're not supposed to go party today. You're not supposed to, it's not an alakhad not to work, but you're not supposed to, there's no behind the money. You're not supposed to do anything but ask this question, Echa, how did this happen? How? How did he destroy the Bet HaMikdash, his own house? How? And I'm going to leave you with this. There's a very famous Midrash of once Jeremiah came back and saw the Choban Bet HaMikdash and started crying hysterically and uncontrollably. He says it was like rivers of tears coming out of his face and he wasn't able to stop it. Hashem told him, go get Moshe Rabbeinu, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov and tell them, go tell them that I don't have a house anymore. So he goes to the river and he says son of Amram son of Amram Amram was Moses' father Hashem Baruch is calling you he needs to speak to you the commentary says why didn't he say listen the Choban Bet HaMikdash look what happened it says that Jeremiah was very scared to say such things he didn't want to be the leader of the nation that lived to see the Choban Bet HaMikdash. So he says, Son of Amram, Hashem is calling you. So Moshe came out and he says, his neshama of course, he says, what's different today than all the other days that Hashem is calling me? And the Malachim are telling Moshe, Son of Amram, don't you know that Hashem destroyed his Bet HaMikdash. Haven't you seen? Moshe moves his neshama and he gets to see the Bet HaMikdash. He sees the river of blood. He sees the destruction. He sees the fire. He sees everything destroyed. 
He gets to see his people and the people think, oh, that's Moshe Rabbeinu. He came here, the Mashiach. The Mashiach is here. They say, the Midrash says, that the original Mashiach is going to be the next Mashiach. Moshe Rabbeinu is going to be the Mashiach. And that's why the uh, Chazal say that part of the Neshama of the Mashiach is going to be from Moshe Rabbeinu and the other part from David HaMelech. So Am Yisrael is in handcuffs, dying, blood everywhere. Their kids are everywhere dying. They're all skinny. They're all starving. And they see Moshe Rabbeinu, they all get happy. Because they think he came to save them. And Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't handle it and he left. And he goes and he calls Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And he tells them, look what Hashem did. Look what happened here. Avraham says to Hashem, Hashem, when I jumped into the fire for you, for your honor, is this shame what I deserve for jumping into the fire? This shame... I jumped into the fire for your honor. This is what I deserve. I put my child that I waited 100 years for. For you. Even though I went against everything. All logic. You told me that for my son, everything is going to happen. But at the same time, I have to kill the son. I did it without asking a single question, Hashem. This is the shame that I deserve to see my children murdered in cold blood. Prayer is not answered. Yitzchak cries to Hashem, I was willing to give myself for you, let my father kill me. This is what I deserve to see. Prayer is not answered. Yaakov, my whole life was dedicated to you. I suffered my whole life. But made sure that all my children sanctified your name. This is what I deserve to see. Prayer not answered. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I served you. I didn't even want to do it. I served you, I led your people out of Egypt, I went through fight, I went through fire, I went through everything. Prayer not answered. Rachel Imenu comes and says to Hashem, at the time that I found out that my father was going to cheat my future husband Yaakov by giving him my sister, I originally planned to fool my father and to make sure that Yaakov doesn't fall for it. So I told him that if I don't give you these signs, then it's not me, it's my sister. But then a moment later I realized that Hashem Elachem, I risked the opportunity of shaming my sister, Chas v'shalom. For a moment, my sister is going to be ashamed that Yaakov didn't want to marry her. That's a damage that I can't fix. That's a post you can't delete. So I sat quiet and did not tell Yaakov while at the same time I told my sister the signs. I even spoke for her and made sure that Yaakov thought it was me. And even when she came to me after, we were both married to him. And embarrassed me. I sat quiet. So if I can sit quiet, Hashem, while they go against me, why did you do this? And Hashem says, for your tears, for your prayer, I promise I'm going to give them back to Bet HaMikdash. Your prayer was answered. So now the question that we ask is this. The very famous question of why was her prayer 
answered and not Moshe, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. But we're going to take it a step further. We're going to ask a simpler question, but that's deeper. If Hashem knew, obviously, Hashem knows the future, Hashem knows that Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Moshe, and Rachel are going to come to him. And they're going to plead. They're going to cry. Why didn't he just send Jeremiah to them before he destroyed Beth Mikdash? If, he's, if he knew that he's going to answer their prayers eventually, why didn't he just send Jeremiah to them before destroying the Beth Mikdash? And the answer, my friends, is simple but deep. Before the Choban Bet HaMikdash, before the fast you're doing today, before the Shior, before even the question, before the thought, there was no tshuva. And therefore they could have prayed from here until the end of the world and it wouldn't have helped. It wouldn't help. Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov can pray Moshe and Aaron can pray, David and Shlomo can pray, Rachel, Imenu, Leah, Rivka, Rachel, um, Sarah, they can all pray. Everyone tells me that their grandfather was a tzaddik, was a rabbi. Their uncle was this and their father was this and everyone's past generation is this. All of that is wonderful for them. But without us taking action, it doesn't matter. Hashem couldn't bring this issue to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and Moshe, and Rachel before Choban Abed Mikdash, because it would have been fruitless. It would have served no purpose because before Choban Abed Mikdash, Am Yisrael did not know that they had to do tshuva. And therefore, without tshuva, the prayers are meaningless. Without tshuva, nothing happens. By the time he came to them, he destroyed the Bet HaMikdash, which led them to do tshuva, which made the prayer fruitful prayer. This is the main thing we have to understand. Today we cry because Am Yisrael has not done tshuva. Today we cry because Am Yisrael still doesn't know and needs to do tshuva. But we can't wait for the rabbis. Waiting for the rabbis 2,000 years ago did not serve us any well. The Gemara says they got punished first because they didn't do their job. They didn't do their job. They didn't rebuke the people. They didn't tell them the truth. Today, if we want to avoid next year's Tisha B'Av, if we want to avoid horror, if we want to avoid disaster, today we have to take the job into our own hands. Each person needs to become a rabbi. You don't need to be a rabbi with speech. You don't need to be a rabbi neat with speech. You can do it in a lot of different ways. You can do it with words, you can do it with money, you can do it with clicks. You have to spread Torah. You have to get Ami said to come back to Hashem. You have to let them know they are doing wrong. It's time to do tshuva. And if they start doing tshuva, we won't be here next year crying. There's not Hashem, we'll be here celebrating. Any questions? Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen. We have another shiur completely different Bezat Hashem in um, an hour and a half from now. It's 6 o'clock. We're now in 15 minutes from now in uh, Miami. I welcome everyone to join me. Bezat Hashem will finish off this Tisha B'Av with some serious motivation to do tshuva and to help Am Yisrael do tshuva.